Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Selena Keneally, the Associate Director for New Mexico EPSCoR, and together with Brittany Vanderwerf, we're hosting today's Smart Grid Seminar. Brittany's running the, the show behind the scenes and she'll be moderating the questions for us. Before we get started, I just wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this seminar and we'll make it available on our website probably sometime next week. So please uh, know that that is available to you. And also um, we I'll have allowed time for question and answer for all of our speakers today. So please use the question and answer box here on your Zoom screen and you're welcome to ask your question at any time. And then Brittany will moderate those and ask the questions of the speakers in, in between times. I'd like to welcome you today to the Smart Grid Seminar, which is part of the New Mexico Research Symposium, which we host every year in collaboration with our partner, the New Mexico Academy of Science. Of course, this year we're an entirely virtual conference um, and we've had events taking place across this entire week. We started November 9th with a wonderful keynote address given by Dr. Betty Korber, which will also be available on our website. And uh, it was certainly timely because she spoke about virus research and the things that are happening at LANL in support of the cure for COVID-19 as well as vaccines. The poster session opened on Tuesday and uh, there was an opportunity for people to view the posters and vote for their favorite. I believe that voting is now closed, but the posters are still available. And then today you can see the Smart Grid Seminar, which is uh, featuring students from the New Mexico Smart Grid Center at uh, New Mexico State and the University of New Mexico. I want to in invite you to join us tomorrow, Friday at three o'clock for the award ceremony where we will be recognizing outstanding service to science, outstanding science teachers, and as well as the winners of the poster competition. If you'd like to know more about any of these events or access the materials, uh, please visit our website. I put a cut lead there because the URL is a bit long. And uh, that website is will be open not only through this week for the research symposium, but uh, probably through the rest of the year. So you have opportunities to, um, to view and participate in those things, even if you weren't able to do that earlier in the week. I'd like to take just a, a couple of minutes to, to give you some context about the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. It, we, we, it is a project administered by New Mexico EPSCoR. And the purpose of EPSCoR is to support the research capacity of our entire state. The Smart Grid Center is an NSF funded award. It's $20 million from the federal government plus $4 million from New Mexico uh, cost share in support of pursuing research and workforce training for next generation electric power production and delivery. We're, we've just started year three. And um, the, the Smart Grid Center itself actually is, is more of a virtual center. And it, let me show you who's involved in our Smart Grid Center. So we have the three research universities in our state, starting with New Mexico State in the south, New Mexico Tech in the middle, and then UNM here where uh, New Mexico EPSOR offices are located. We also collaborate with the Community College, Santa Fe Community College, both our national laboratories, Los Alamos and Sandia. Explora is our outreach museum partner. And the Microgrid Systems Laboratory is a nonprofit as part of this. And you'll notice that we also have nine industry partners, which are featured at the bottom of the slide. So the Smart Grid Center has a number of research thrusts, and you guys will hear about four of them today. And we have, uh, I think, about 140 people who are working on this effort, both on the research side, as well as the education, workforce development, and outreach side of things. So without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our speakers today. We're going to hear first from Shuba Pati from New Mexico State, then Jesse Cock. Oh, I knew I was going to mess this up. I wrote it down. Coach Marski from UNM, Ali Garashi from UNM, and then Anju James from New Mexico State. So each of our students will have an opportunity to do a, pre a brief presentation in about 15 minutes. We'll pause for questions and then we'll move on to the next uh, student. If we have time at the end, we'd be happy to entertain some more questions and um, so without further ado, I'd like to in, uh, introduce Shuba and um, let you know that she works with Dr. Satish Ranade at New Mexico State. And uh, Shuba, if you'd like to un unmute, turn on your camera and I'll let you take control of the screen. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Shiva, and today I'm going to talk about the resiliency announcement of the smart grid, considering the time varying priority of dynamic load. So what happens to the grid in case of a natural disaster, like hurricane, or in case of a cyber physical attack, uh, a part of the grid get damaged, some of the lines get cut, and some of the generator might fail. All of these things normally lead to shutdown of the power system. For example, in case of a Hurricane Sandy, we had $50 billion loss. So how do we define the resiliency? Uh, the ability of the power system to recover either completely or partially from adversity is defined as resiliency. Now the resiliency is defined by a term called adaptability. So adaptability in biology is the ability of an organism to respond and survive in case of an environmental distress. Similar phenomenon is expected to happen in case of power system. Now, the next thing is how the resiliency is different from the reliability. So in case of resiliency, the priority is to quickly recover through active management of the grid. Whereas the goal of the reliability is to primarily maintain the continuity of the service. And how do we do that? We do that by making the infrastructure redundant. One more key difference between the resiliency and the reliability is uh, the resilience, the objective in case of re resiliency is to maximize the throughput, whereas the objective in case of reliability is to minimize the cost. One more thing is difference between the resiliency and reliability is the resiliency is in case of resiliency, it is time sensitive, whereas in uh, reliability, we focus on the continuity of the service. In case of resiliency, we focus on repair emergency actions. Whereas in case of reliability, we focus on safety and over anticipation. Now, in case of resiliency, uh, we have uh, two parts. First is the resiliency oriented design. And the next is the resiliency oriented operation. So basically, in case of resiliency oriented design, we focus on basically the infrastructure enhancement, like the strengthening of the vulnerable component, increasing uh, adequacy of the power supply, increase, increasing topological flexibility. Also, uh, in case of resiliency oriented design, we uh, focus on some of, the, some of the specific design action, where we can enhance the resiliency, like upgrading the flow wall classes, adding the transfer skies, installing, back, installing backup then uh, uh, generator, or adding sectionalizer. Uh, so for instance, we have taken IEEE 24 bus reliability test system in our experimental setup to demonstrate the resiliency study. As you can see in this picture, we have taken uh, IEEE reliability 24 bus system and we have taken two cases. You can see the case one is consider uh, one path for the tornado or hurricane or, or any kind of natural disaster. And case two is another path for another uh, path for a natural disaster. And we have taken two critical loads at bus 19 and bus 20. Now, in case of uh, resiliency, uh, so uh, we need to define the objective function. So here the objective function is to minimize the throughput or which is same as uh, minimize the, uh, maximize the, sorry, maximize the throughput and minimize the mismatch between the uh, ge total generation and the total demand. This is like a optimal power flow problem. In this objective function, we have constraint on generation as well as line capacity. Along with that, we have taken additional constraint so that we can uh, always supply the power to the critical load at every point of time. Now, when I, we simulate the case one, so 
So you can see there are uh, some lines that are greens and the, some lines that are red. So the lines that are red, they are all they are the lines that are getting overloaded, and the lines that are green, they are getting underloaded. In when I say overloaded, I mean the load in the line increased by thirty percent. Similarly, if we take the case two and uh, uh, or the part two of the tornado or a natural disaster, and we see the lines that are red are getting overloaded, and the lines that are green are getting uh, underloaded. So the uh, study of multiple resiliency test cases on a simulated model of a power system can infer about the changes required to improve the resiliency of the grid. Like in our case, identify the lines for which the line capacity needs to be increased or decreased. So we can similarly uh, uh, simulate other disturbances scenario and also design uh, consideration can be made to enhance the resiliency. Now our focus is on resiliency oriented operation. In resiliency oriented operation, basically our priority is mainly optimal scheduling. When I say optical, optimal scheduling, means the improving the resiliency by local supply of load or uh, by curtailment uh, reduction. So, which basically deals with unit commitment, energy storage schedule, adjustable load schedule, or energy management system. Now, in this case context, one important consideration is the time varying criticality of the load. So, there are operational uncertainty in the load. Certain load doesn't maintain same level of criticality at all the point of time. For example, the power supply to a subway train network is critical for a certain time after a storm or a hurricane or a natural disaster hits, which would allow the train to settle either at destination or at nearest station. However, once the train are parked, the operation could be halted temporarily to ensure the safety and maintenance. During this time, the subway train network may no longer act as critical load to the grid. Now, in addition to the time varying criticality of the load, we also know that DER, like wind generator, are affected by disaster like hurricane. As in case of hurricane tornado, the wind power generation is a function of uh, time. So in order to model that, we added this constraint. K critical, as you can see here, K critical is the set consisting of the indices of all the loads with time bearing criticality, where lambda represents the fraction of the Kth critical load that needs to be supplied for a given disaster scenario F as a function of time. Then <clears throat> we also assume that the load vary randomly with respect to time. Here, the KDER is the set consisting of the index of each DER, and mu is the fraction of the power generated by the kth DER for scenario S at time T. Now, the power demand of load uh, is assumed to be com comprising of two random variables. Uh, P, uh, one for RVIP and one RVAQ, one for active power and one for reactive power, and hourly normalized load profile, as you can see here. And we have taken mu and uh, uh, mean and a standard deviation as 0.02. So RVIP and RVAQ uh, denote the random changes in the demand of real and reactive power, respectively. And here we have taken the normal distribution. Now, we refer to the resiliency curve to de determine the feasibility of the grid or a particular disaster scenario. The resiliency curve or the feasibility curve relates to the adversarial variables such as weather intensity to failure probability of the individual component. For example, in this figure, the overhead line failure probability is shown probability is shown 
as a function of wind speed. Then we defined a metric for measuring the resiliency score of a system, which could, uh, which we call as risk index, where you can see the PK is the probability of the occurrence for the case scenario and FK is the quantification of its impact or the fragility associated with it. Now, the major objective is to optimize the operation of the grid in response to the adversarial scenario. Here, our goal is to deliver the maximum energy to the load, maximum energy or power to the load given the limited generation. The optimal power flow solution are computed at uh, every 10 minutes at fixed interval, which is 10 minutes we have taken to accommodate the uncertainty such as the time varying criticality of the load, the loss in the DER generation, the topological changes and the adversarial uh, event. Now, uh, so here uh, you can see we have uh, the algorithm here for resiliency oriented operation where uh, we assess the uh, threat vector and identify the time varying failure probability of critical infrastructure and, and predict the time varying priority of critical load based on the scenario. And we run the optimization of uh, power flow and then identify the load, which uh, the load which needs to be cut. Out. Here for a simulation, we have considered a co-simulation environment comprising of, comprising of both distribution and uh, uh, transmission system. We have taken to IEEE 24 bus reliability test system at bus 19 and three, uh, and we have connected two IEEE 13 bus system. Uh, we have taken two uh, IEEE 13 bus system to do the study. So here uh, we use the MART power tool in MATLAB for the transmission system modeling, and we use the op open DSS for the distribution system modeling. Now, uh, we define a dominant disaster scenario, like we define a natural disaster scenario where both the transmission and distribution grids are affected. We assume fault at fault and tripping at some bosses, loss of uh, certain distribution generation and load. We assume that the load at bus 20, as you have seen uh, before, is the time bearing critical load, where the critical nature of the load per scenario is defined by the following weight function. Here you can see the T. T is the time at which the event or the disaster get initiated. And alpha is called, we have taken alpha as thousand, is the time constant of the exponential decay function. Now, for modeling the frizzality of the grid due to the disasters, we considered the frizzality curve for a tornado as shown in the earlier. We assume the distribution feeder at bus 19 has overhead lines that get affected or faulted or fault happens over there with failure probability defined by the causality curve. Now, this graph shows the value of the objective function uh, corresponding to the optimal power flow uh, at every 10 minutes. This is just a simple test scenario. We are working on uh, creating on some uh, test cases which resemble to the real world scenario so that we can enhance the resiliency study. So here you can see the blue line shows the values of the objective uh, function. We keep the criticality of the load uh, fixed where uh, the lines uh, that red, so here we vary the criticality of the load dynamically. Thank you. Outstanding presentation, Shiva. Um, as we wait for questions to come in, I'm, I'll have one that I'd like to ask um, for myself. Where do you think this, um, where is the direction of your research going in the future? Um, my future uh, uh, direction of the work would be like, uh, uh, once uh, I'm done with this time varying criticality and then we will consider the statistical distribution and then we'll see like, we'll uh, take 
more practical cases like this is just uh, like uh, test cases which i'm doing this experimental setup so next would be like a actual disaster scenario and seeing how the resiliency uh, how uh, we can improve the resiliency over there um, and what kind of disaster scenarios are you thinking of besides the tornado? Were you thinking? Uh, like, uh, uh, like in case of a hurricane or uh, in case of a uh, uh, tornado. Okay, cool. I was just wondering, um, I know it's, it's particularly relevant for all of us who live in New Mexico um, to think about wildfires and how they influence our energy distribution grid. And so I'm betting that you'll probably look at that too. Or maybe sure. All right. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions, and if you can always ask questions um, for Shuba at the end, if we have time as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll give it about another thirty seconds, and then we're going to move on to Jesse. Once again, thank you so much for the presentation, Shiva. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Shuba. We really appreciate your, your talk and your contributions to the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. So thanks so much for your time and energies today. And next, I'm going to introduce our next speaker and I will have a chance to try and uh, say his name, my second chance to say his name <laughs> correctly. So I'm really pleased to welcome to the screen, Jesse Koch-Mersky, I'm almost getting there, who works with Dr. Cheney Shermack here at UNM. And Jesse, I'll let you take over the screen and the video. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so what's nice about the uh, uh, the previous presentation is that it actually kind of segues really well into the type of work that I do here in the economics department, specifically for the Smart Grid Center. Um, so let me just move the panel of people because it's covering up my slides. There we go. Okay. So my name is Jesse Kaczmarski. Um, I'm, you know, working out of the Department of Economics here at UNM. Um, I'm a third year PhD student and uh, I am here to present uh, the second survey installment that we've done for this uh, for this EBSCOR project. So the title of this one is uh, the consumer acceptance and demand of microgrid installations. Uh, and specifically, we're focusing on the four corners. So we've got Arizona, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico. Um, and this is a dimension of this larger project that is often ignored, right? So it's very common to build the systems required for a distributed feed or microgrid. Um, but then there's the other aspect of it's not always just if we build it, they will come. It needs to be desired, right? And so in that's what I'm going to aim to show you guys what we're looking at around here. OK, so microgrids, they've become a staple, right, in this push towards grid modernization in the United States. So it, when you talk about grid modernization in the United States, there's a lot of things that always come up. So the first thing would be the smart grid. Uh, and then that usually entails some sort of microgrid installation. And then also there is the demand response at program aspect of those. Um, but the, the question kind of remains is who's going to pay for these microgrids, especially if we're going to be talking about community resilience. So Lots, uh, I, I would say quite a few of these microgrid installations, uh, they, they are either done commercially. So these are large facilities that will install them so that they can keep uptime uh, if there are any issues with the grid or say they, they draw too much electricity, uh, that sort of thing. But then as we look towards grid modernization in the future, especially areas that have low reliability or uh, are at increased um, risk for resilience issues, uh, the microgrid becomes a very uh, common uh, solution that's often proposed. Uh, but the costs associated are, are very difficult to measure because each microgrid installation is built specific to the needs in mind uh, of that community, right? Um, but what it 
at the end of the day, uh, what we see a lot of is the, the, the most obvious mechanism for this is that the electricity, electricity consumers themselves would be the ones paying for the microgrid. Uh, and this happens a lot. Anytime there's large infrastructure projects, those costs often get passed down through increases in the customer charges on the electricity bill or just slight increases on electricity generation costs in general. And that's usually approved through the public, public regulatory commission of said state or area or region. Uh, it really depends a lot on how, uh, how that uh, electricity provider is managed. You know, are they an investor owned? Uh, are they a, a municipal? That sort of thing. It really depends a lot on that. Um, but so what we're going to do here in this, this survey is we're going to analyze specifically a distributed uh, feeder microgrid installation uh, for community resilience and reliability uh, in, in the four corners. And so we figured that it's really important that customers have a say in this decision uh, to introduce a microgrid into their grid. Uh, so they're, they might think it's a great idea. Microgrids might be a great idea, but I don't want it in my backyard. There's that, that sort of aspect to it too. And so really what I'm trying to do in this survey is elicit the, what drives the decision-making process to, uh, to fork over some cash <laughs> uh, to, for these, these uh, microgrid installations. Uh, so consumer perspectives actually on microgrid installations have not been uh, researched in the US, uh, specifically what drive those decision making processes, and then also what is the median amount of money that a consumer would be willing to pay. It just hasn't been done. And so this is the first study of its kind to do that. Uh, and because it is the first study of its kind to do that, it gives uh, policymakers and industry professionals a metric on what uh, people in general are willing to to pay for these so they can try to tailor microgrid costs for that. And so the premise of a microgrid, um, I think this is a very technical audience, so I'm not going to go into too much depth, but the distributed feeder microgrid system, it, it's able to island itself from the utility grid and provide electricity and distribute electricity to its, its community um, uh, when necessary, basically. So I'm just going to leave it at that. It's a lot more complex, but uh, that's basic, that's what we're trying to evaluate here. How much do people really want these? And so the decision-making process, it's not as simple as saying, okay, yes, there is a res resilience increase or reliability increase. And so I'm going to just say, yes, it's not exactly that simple because think about people who live in Albuquerque who have an incredible uptime for electricity. Uh, we're talking about you know, never, almost never having electricity outages. And if you do, it's gonna be, you know, maybe like 30 minutes uh, at the maximum end. Uh, so the, the safety and safety scores and stuff like that here in, in, in urban areas in the, in the Southwest specifically uh, are, are very high uh, because we're not as prone to natural disasters as other areas of the country. And so the desire or the need is not necessarily there. Um, but there are ways to educate and inform uh, individuals so that we can try to elicit their actual willingness to pay. So we asked these consumers, um, uh, would they be willing to pay for the microgrid? And that decision-making uh, process is actually a function of a lot of things. So anything from financial burden, so how much do they have to pay? That's going to be a very significant uh, in, in impact on uh, whether they, they agree to uh, pay for the microgrid. Ideological concerns, so political ideology we see often has uh, impacts on decision-making processes. Uh, and then attitudes and preferences. And those that's a very broad term that I left there, uh, but that can be anything from their attitudes and preferences towards pollution from electricity generation uh, to things uh, like they don't uh, agree that uh, the consumer is the one who's supposed to pay for it. You know, there, there's lots of uh, there, uh, attitudes, preferences that fall under the ideological banner. And then there's the socio-demographic banner. So things like how educated an individual is, how much income they have actually has a large effect uh, where they are. So rural urban divide is actually what we find to be a very significant factor in trying to do this analysis is that people at the end of the line are willing to, uh, they, they, consider microgrid installations as a, as a, as a strong, uh, ha as having strong potential in solving their, their reliability out uh, issues, things like that. And versus people, as I had explained earlier, 
that, that are in the urban setting that don't really have these sorts of issues uh, and other sociodemographics. And then there's the desire for a community need. Does, does the community actually think they need one? And then there's also an individual need. So I, I might want the microgrid because I know that a certain part of my community could benefit from it, but I don't specifically need one or vice versa. And then uh, the information. So are people fully educated on the microgrid, what its benefits are, uh, what's it, what its costs are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what, what it can be used for? Because when you say microgrid, it's such a, such a broad word, right? Uh, it, it, microgrids vary significantly. And from that, that function of those processes, uh, you, you, can, you, you can elicit a yes, no, or a not sure response. And so we did actually conduct a survey. We're still conducting a survey. That's why uh, this is the results here I should have mentioned earlier are preliminary. Uh, so they're not, this isn't a complete study, um, but we started surveying people in September and we're currently surveying individuals. We have about 3,500 responses at the moment from the four corner states. Uh, and we're trying right now to get up to 5,500 responses. That's what we paid for. <laughs> and so we're, we're trying to work on that at the moment. Uh, the respondents, they're, they're meant to be regionally representative. So we were sampling uh, people based on education, rural urban divide, uh, population statistics between the four states, um, things like that, income, education, I, I think I already said education, uh, age, gender, all these things matter. So we're trying right now our most difficult, where we've already got a, our easy responses out of the way, you know, the urban high income, that sort of thing. We're now we're having issues with low income, rural individuals getting those um, uh, responses. And then, so th these types of responses are collected through Qualtrics. It's a, it's a Salt Lake City uh, based company. And um, so, so they're working on that collection right now. We work close hand in hand trying to do that. And then uh, what we do in the surveys, we fully inform them of the benefits of a distributed feeder microgrid. Uh, and I'll get into what the what exactly we what type of information we provide them in the next slide. Uh, but we actually also ran an experiment in this survey. So we wanted to determine how do people's desire or willingness to pay for such a microgrid actually differ depending on what type of benefit structure they receive. So if they receive direct benefits or indirect benefits from the microgrid. So direct benefits, that experiment was basically that during the information process, we ask them, would you actually vote for this program knowing that the microgrid would provide electricity to your community and then support the critical infrastructure in your community during high uh, stress events? And then indirect benefits is where we basically skipped that and said that it was installed in a nearby community, but in times of grid stress, that microgrid being on the larger grid could reduce the probability of outages in your, in your community. And so you basically have two very different uh, benefit structures that we're presenting to the respondent. And what we want to do is measure the difference between the two as well. And so the information we provide them, uh, we run them through a battery of information. Uh, we, we tell them what a microgrid is, uh, why do we need a microgrid, especially in the Southwest. Uh, we give them economic resilience, reliability, and environmental benefits. And I noted a caveat on that environmental benefits because for some reason, uh, the general assumption right now is that microgrids are renewable or they have some sort of uh, environmental benefit to them. Uh, but in reality, only 20%, I think that was the latest statistic I could find, only 20% of microgrids in the United States are renewable only. Uh, and so that's the type of information we provided them. We said, uh, we didn't say that it was gonna be renewable or not. What we did was give them that percentage. Uh, and we allowed them to mentally create their own um, adjustments from that. Uh, for costs, we informed them of the cost of producing electricity at a microgrid on average. Uh, I can't remember where that source was from, <laughs> but it is, a, it is a national lab that did a study on that. Um, and we used that and compared it to the average price of electricity per kilowatt hour in the Southwest. And that's where we left it. So, and then for, because you can't, specifically say, okay, this is the average cost of a community microgrid because they're so, they vary so much. And then for examples, we gave them examples. So we told them about how microgrids provide critical infrastructure supply in, at the Denver National, International Airport. 
and then also how a specific community in, in rural California uh, was able to insulate themselves from rolling blackouts uh, over the last couple of years because of their, their installation from a, their microgrid installation. And so then we asked them a basic, a basic referendum style question, you know, taking into consideration your desire for this microgrid, as well as your current disposable income, it's very important. Uh, would you vote for it if it costs you, if it increased your, your customer charge by a certain amount of money for 24 billing cycles, right? So this is a two year commitment that they're asked to, to vote on. And then they're given a randomly distributed amount of money that's actually based on uh, the Four Corners average electricity bill. And so there are eight levels in which a respondent could be randomly chosen. These are chosen on a uniform distribution uh, and each person would see one of these, right? So that could be on the rounding column, 10 cents, 50 cents added to their bill for 24 cycles. But some people would even see $17 added to their bill over the 24 uh, cycles. So this is, uh, and, and at the top you see the average bill in the four corners for the entire year uh, is $86.97. And we built it off of this structure because we want to basically with the type of methodology we use, it's uh, we use a logistic regression to estimate our point estimates. And then we use median willingness to pay uh, calculations uh, Traditionally, that's, a, that's from Cameron and James, but we use a Hobb and McConnell method from 2003. Uh, that's just the citation for you. Uh, but this exponential increase is interesting because we're gonna be able to see how people respond in their votes, depending on how much money that we ask them to pay for. And you see that here. So what you would want to see is exactly what we see in our responses. So people who voted yes in the top left panel uh, they voted yes overwhelmingly when they saw really low bid offers or offered payments, right? Uh, so if the cost was within like 10 cents, 5 cents, whatever, people were saying yes, you know, that's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. The more you asked people to pay, the less people said yes. The opposite should then be true by, uh, and it's, yes, so the opposite should then be true in the no revolts. So people who voted no, uh, overwhelmingly probably did so because they were seeing very high responses. You see that with the upward slope there. Uh, also, these lines aren't fitted in any way. I just threw these on there in PowerPoint to show directionality, so don't, <laughs> it's not that perfect. And then for the not sure votes, if people are actually not sure, there should be no visible distinction in uh, a trend, basically, in offered payments by uh, vote type. And what we do, we do see that. So. Uh, that's that's a good little check to see that people are actually saying not sure because they're not sure, which is which is a nice little check. And so we asked them initially before that question that you saw, we asked them initially if it was no cost to you, would you vote for this program? Uh, would you vote to have an installation installed? About 57% of people said yes, almost 30% said no, or I'm sorry, not sure. And then the rest said no, no. But uh, when we asked them to pay, the people who weren't sure became a lot more sure. And now we have about 30% of the people saying no and less people saying yes. And that's what you would expect from a survey uh, styled in this manner where you ask them to pay now, then people will kind of drop off. And so from running a logistic regression, I don't use any point estimates in here because it would just take all day to explain them all. Uh, but some key takeaways from uh, what we find is that the more, so the more that the offered payment is, so the more we ask them to pay, the less likely they're going to say yes. So all of these are in relation to the likelihood that they're going to say yes. Uh, and these are conservative estimates. So we actually recoded not sure as no's. We didn't give them the opportunity to be either yes or no. We just recoded them as not sure, or I'm sorry, no. So these are extremely conservative estimates, but um, so, Right, and so if they fell into the category of respondents who were going to receive direct benefits from the microgrid, they were much more likely to uh, participate in this study. I'm sorry, in the, to vote yes on the referendum. And then the utility, uh, do they think that the utility actually has their best interests in mind? This is a really good question because uh, you want to try to elicit, do, they, do the people who are responding think, actually like trust their, really, their provider, right? Do they think that the provider is doing the right things for them? Uh, that People who agreed with that actually did see uh, participate in the program a lot more. 
And then um, whether they had a concern for pollution from electricity production was also positive and statistically significant. Uh, this is interesting because um, it sort of creates this, this slight mechanism between do they think microgrids are going to somehow lead to a reduction in electricity production? Uh, this isn't necessarily true. And people who bring, like a lot of people in urban environments actually receive electricity from larger, you know, uh, plants that are very far away, right? Like we get a lot of electricity from the Four Corners, uh, power plants and things like this, and they, they come to us. But what we're talking about is adding a microgrid to your, your community, or it's going to generate electricity in your area. Um, so it almost maybe hints at people not fully understanding or taking into account that voting yes for this might mean that you're going to have a natural gas or a diesel generator two blocks from your house. So, you know, so people, that wasn't very clear. And then, uh, so that this cost sharing ideology, we asked them, do you think that electricity customers should bear a burden in sharing costs for uh, for this microgrid, for like infrastructure upgrades. People who did agree with that were much more likely to participate. Uh, political ideology, this is negative because we measured it on a scale um, where from the mean, are you more conservative? So more conservative respondents uh, who self-reported being more conservative um, were less likely to participate in this this microgrid installation. Uh, people who work from home post COVID, much more likely. And that's likely because of the proposed reliability benefits of a uh, community microgrid. And then income is just a check that we do. Uh, if you have more money, economic theory, a very shallow economic theory should suggest that uh, you, you're able to have more disposable income and more likely to participate. Uh, and that was true. And so from those estimates, we can actually calculate what the median willingness to pay is for an electricity cu customer in the United States, or I'm sorry, in the four corners. And so if we don't include any of the covariates that any, any of these predictors that we have on this slide, uh, it's about $8.21 per person per month for 24 months uh, for direct benefits. Those are for people who are going to receive the direct benefits. For indirect, you would expect, and it is what we see, that there is less willingness to pay. So by $2, which is a, which is a large amount. And these are both highly statistically significant um, at the net, I think at the 99% confidence interval. Uh, so very strong results. And then on that, that rightmost column is going to be the total over the 24 months. Uh, and then if when you add the actual covariates here that were used to predict, um, and this, this is more getting into the weeds of how we do willingness to pay calculations, uh, it doesn't actually change that much uh, from the original estimates. And this is calculated again, as I said earlier, using Hobbin McConnell's uh, linear willingness to pay methodology. And so these are preliminary results. These are just a subsample of the, the total results that we're, 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 we're trying to get. Uh, but our future research, most like that is very simple, very shallow uh, analysis of what we have actually going on. What we're going to be doing a lot of is a heterogeneity analysis. So looking at regional, uh, so how does Utah willingness to, how does willingness to pay differ from being in Utah or Arizona or New Mexico? Um, uh, what about rural urban divide? So the, those those rural individuals um, who suffer uh, more so from uh, outages and things like that, are they willing to pay more or less? I'm not sure because being rural is oftentimes more uh, correlated with having less income. So we're going to be digging into that some more. Uh, we're going to also be looking at the differences of willingness to pay amongst the various demographics and then also political ideologies. And then uh, we also have a lot more to look into in the survey. I mean, we have things like how frequent was their mo how frequent are outages for them? What was their longest outage? Have they ever been affected by wildfire? We have an entire wildfire valuation section that my colleague's going to be working on. Uh, how does the response change when they know that the willing the microgrid is for wildfire mitigation? Things like this. And then, yeah, all right. So waiting for the remaining survey responses, and then uh, we'll be doing ourselves. I'll be doing a reassessment of willingness to pay because I asked a question in the survey that said, would your answer have changed if the microgrid is guaranteed to be all renewable? 
And so I'll be able to take the, that response and recode responses and see, you know, what does the willingness to pay look like if it is all renewable, right? It'd be very interesting uh, to go into that. And then as being in, on the New Mexico Smart Grid Center, we plan to do a micro analysis of New Mexico. So we oversampled for New Mexico. Um, and so we're going to be doing a micro analysis of that. Uh, with that, that's the end of my, my presentation and I'd be more than happy to take uh, questions, so. Awesome, uh, always so much to learn in your presentation, Jesse. Um, so I will run in a little short on time, but if we get any questions in the Q&A box, um, I will be happy to ask them. A question that I got um, from another source <laughs> is, um, how has COVID impacted your research? And are you seeing this reflected in the survey? You are seeing it reflected in the survey responses, but do you feel like it will have a noticeable impact on your eventual data? That's a really good question. And we have lots of controls for that because uh, we didn't start running this survey until September. So we had a lot of time to really build the survey around COVID. So we have questions asking people, respondents, you know, were you financially impacted by COVID-19? Are you working from home more now that uh, COVID-19 as, you know, as a result of COVID-19, uh, are you, I already said financially impacted, but that's the big one is the financial impact of COVID-19, uh, because that we're asking people to accept a higher financial burden. Uh, so that, that question really boils down to income. Um, and so we have questions in the survey and we'll, we're able to estimate how those impact uh, responses. So we can run those in the logistic regression and see um, are, if they're financially impacted by COVID, uh, does that change the likelihood that they're gonna vote yes or no in the program? Uh, I have yet to do that analysis at the moment, um, but that's a really great question. It's there and we're gonna go into that a lot. So fear, fear no more, <laughs> we'll take care of that. Outstanding. So I think we're going to bring Sabrina on. Thanks, Brittany. And thanks, Jesse, so much for your talk. It's really exciting to see the kinds of results that you're getting. It's, uh, it's, I, as a social scientist myself, I'm glad to see that that people are included into these overall models and it seems super important. I noticed in your talk that you, you your sense is that people don't really understand what a microgrid is. And I, I just want to mention that part of the Smart Grid Center, actually, we're doing some work with Explora in helping to promote that idea. And we'll be developing activities that get, that get deployed at museums around the state to teach people about microgrids. And then ultimately, Explora is going to mount an exhibit at their, uh, their new teen center about microgrids. So I think there's some opportunities, actually, to take some of your findings and, uh, and, and put them into those efforts. So. Well, we really appreciate your, your time and energy on, uh, on the Smart Grid Center research. And uh, thanks so much for being with us today. There, there is a question that just popped up in the chat. Oh, um, please go for it. Yes, yep. there is. Give me just one second. I'm going to take a read. You could go ahead and read that out loud. For the people. Yeah, so uh, I discussed this uh, political stance quite a bit in uh, what we use to kind of control for responses. And the question is, do you think that the transition to a more renewable friendly presidential administration uh, will change responses as the national discourse changes? That's a, that's a really good question because, um, uh, yeah, so that, that is a really good question uh, because I just wanna permanently unmute myself so I don't have to hold the space bar. But um, wow, that's a, that's a heck of a question actually. It's not as simple as one would think because the assumption that microgrids are entirely renewable is just not true. Um, and, but if it were true, you know, if, if, if we do start just, you know, using only renewable electricity, that could change responses entirely. And that's kind of a, a larger focus of my, my, my future research coming up here. We have questions for that, like I explained earlier. Um, but political ideology and its impact, you know, that's usually a, a response that's associated with rhetoric. And then also the, the mechanism uh, between uh, political ideology and uh, microgrid installations, it might not necessarily be because of renewable energy or anything like that. It might actually be much more so uh, that political ideology is uh, 
correlated with being fiscally conservative. Uh, and so they might not want to invest in community projects as a, as a result. So there's a lot to unpack there. And I actually think that the renewable friendly um, discourse is gonna be a very small portion of what drives uh, political ideologies relationship with uh, microgrid installations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it seems like this is a, an especially interesting time to be doing this work as things are, are changing in the environment. <laughs> So I would like to introduce our next speaker for today, and that is Ali Gorashi, and he uh, works with Dr. Ali Bidrum at the University of New Mexico, and I'll let Ali unmute and share your screen. Hi, everybody. I'm Ali. I'm a PhD student at UNM. Uh, uh, I'm a student at UNM and uh, today I'm going to uh, present some part of my research that is supported by NME PS Core program. I'm going to talk about the cooperative dynamic power balancing and smoothing in a photovoltaic hybrid energy storage system using multiple reactive agents. Firstly, I provide an introduction to the topic. After that, uh, I discuss about the power management systems in PV hybrid energy storage system. After that, I provide a short description about the case study system. And after that, I propose the distributed hybrid control strategy in this work. And then I evaluate the performance of the system using a computer simulation. And finally, I will conclude this presentation. So the first question is that why dynamic power balancing is important. You know, it's a basic rule in power system that the amount of power that is generated must be always equal to the amount of power that is consumed. Otherwise, we will have a blackout. Uh, this is more challenging in PV power systems. Uh, please assume a diesel generator. In this case, you can increase the fuel uh, on the engine and you can increase the power generation. And you can reduce the fuel to reduce the power generation. So you can easily uh, control the output power and balance the generation and the load. But in PV power systems, we have not full control on the power generation because you know the power generation is related to the uh, weather condition and time of the day. Uh, so in the systems that we have no access to the utility grid, for example, assume an isolated microgrid system, uh, we need additional devices in order to balance the generation and load. And these devices are energy storage systems. Here you can see a very simple explanation of how energy storage systems works in a PV ESS system. Uh, in a very simple term, uh, we send the difference between the generation power and the load power, which is called the net power, to the energy storage system. As you can see in this figure, uh, when the PV power generation is higher than the load power, the output power of the energy storage system is negative. So the energy storage system plays uh, the role of the load for the system. And when the load is higher than the power generation, when the load of load power is higher than the generation power, the output power of the battery is positive. So battery plays the role of a generation unit. So with this simple uh, strategy, we can balance the generation load in a PVSS system. But you know, in dynamic power balancing, the sampling time may be around, maybe less than one second or around in this scale. Um, as you know, we have a uh, lots of fluctuation in the load and also we may have lots of high frequency variation on the output power of the PV. So in this case, the net power that is sent to the uh, battery energy storage system has a high frequency variation. And this high frequency variation uh, sometimes is problematic for us. The reason is that the battery energy storage system that are widely used for power balancing, for example, lithium ion batteries, they have a slow dynamic response and sometimes they cannot track this high frequency variation. And sometimes in isolated system, we may have some slight deviation in the voltage and frequency. In addition, these batteries have limited life cycle. I mean, the number of times that we can charge and discharge these batteries is limited. So, so uh, when we send this high frequency variation to the battery, uh, the battery needs to frequently charge and discharge, which reduce the lifetime of the battery. In order to avoid this problem, in HES technology, we use a supercapacitor that works in tandem with the BSS. Uh, in order to improve the response of the system. Here you can see how hybrid energy storage system works. As you can see, there is a power management system, which is responsible for power allocation between different, different energy storage units. 
as you can see, it sends the low it, it sends the low frequency variation of the net power to the battery energy storage systems, so it will increase the lifetime of the battery. In addition, the high frequency variation will be sent to the supercapacitor. The supercapacitor has a high um, power density and has a fast dynamic response, so it can easily track this high frequency variation, so the voltage and quality of the line will increase, especially in isolated system. There are different ways in order to design power management system in PV hybrid energy storage systems. The rule-based methods are widely used because they have a lower computational complexity and are really suitable for real-time applications. But uh, in these methods, usually there is a centralized supervisory controller which is responsible for decision-making for all the, all the primary controllers inside, inside the system. But using the centralized architecture has two major drawbacks. Uh, the first drawback is that a single failure on the supervisory control on the centralized supervisory control will lead to a system collapse. In addition, uh, if we want to design a very fle flexible and adaptable system, uh, we need to design lots of operational mode for the primary controllers. And uh, in centralized architecture, it can be a very tedious task for the system designer to do this because it requires a very complex logic for the system. In addition, uh, implementation of this complex logic using a central using a microcontroller uh, may not be suitable in real and may not be applicable in some real time application. In order to avoid this problem in this work, we provide a distributed management technique in, a, uh, in using a multi agent based control strategy. Before I introduce our proposed approach, uh, please look at to the case study system. The case study system, the case study system contains four modules. One of them is a PV power generation module. Another one is a battery energy storage system, and also there is a supercapacitor module. We have also a load module. The load module is an isolated AC microgrid that the portion of its power demand is supplied by the PV hybrid energy storage system. Uh, the structure of our multi-agent based structure based control strategy is that. Uh, in, us, in, in our approach, each, uh, each module is considered as an intelligent reactive agent that can uh, cooperate with other agents and change its operational mode and dynamic behavior res with respect to the condition of the system. The cooperation of these agents uh, provide a global pattern of orga organization that forms a dynamic power balance in the smooth thing in the system. Here you can see the hierarchical control structure of each agent. As you can see, each agent has also a data acquisition and information processing module. This module receives data from communication using, uh, through communication with other agents and also from local measurements. Then it processes the information and send them to the uh, hierarchical control system. At the top level of this uh, control, uh, at the top level of this uh, hierarchical control system, there is a supervisory controller which is responsible for dynamic decision making and selecting the operational mode of the low level controllers. Then there is a power charge controller which is responsible to calculate the reference current in order to obtain the objective of the, of the objective of the system at, at each operational mode. Then there is a primary controller that calculates the duty cycle of the power electronic converters in order to track the reference current. Here you can see the hierarchical structure of the PV module. You can see the PV module uh, can work in maximum power point tracking or, or it can re uh, reduce its power generation and works in load following mode based on the condition of the system. One of the novelties uh, of our work is that we let the PV module uh, co to cooperate the to cooperate with uh, other uh, subsystem, especially the supercapacitor, and the cooperation between P uh, PV and the supercapacitor, um, we will see that it, it will increase the reliability of the system. Uh, here is the hierarch hierarchical structure of the supercapacitor. As you can see, the supercapacitor can work uh, in fully charged or MPT mode. In this case, it is in idle mode. Uh, and also it can work in normal operation. And in this case, the high frequency variation of the net power it will be sent to the supercapacitor. Here is also the hierarchical structure of the battery energy storage systems. As you can see, the battery energy storage system has a smooth charging module. Typically, the in, uh, as you can see in the uh, top figure, uh, the, tip, the typical smooth charging method is illustrated. In this method, there is a low pass filter. So filter the high frequency variation and send the low frequency variation of the net power to the battery and send the high frequency variation to the supercapacitor. 
What in our proposed approach, we use a controlled feedback in order to provide a cooperation between the supercapacitor and the battery. As a, as a result of this cooperation, the battery can control the state of the charge of the supercapacitor. So it can prevent the supercapacitor to frequently become charged or discharged because supercapacitor has a very low energy capacity. Uh, using this technique, you can see that the minimum required size of the supercapacitor will reduce. In order to simulate the behavior of the system, we need a dynamic model of the system. You know, uh, each agent has a hybrid dynamic behavior. Uh, the top level controller, the supervisory controller is a discrete even dynamic system. And also we have time driven dynamics, which are the dynamic of the controller, primary controller and charge controller, and also the dynamic of the physical system. So each agent is a hybrid dynamic system. In addition, we have lots of interdependency between the discrete and continuous dynamics of the agents. So in order to model all this concurrent dynamic behavior of the agents in one framework, we use an input output hybrid automaton, which is a very uh, suitable framework for modeling com concurrent complex hybrid dynamical systems. Uh, here is a case study system that we simulate this behavior. As you can see, there is a, a PV module that has 100 kilowatt power capacity. Also, the battery energy storage system has 100 kilowatt rated power. Uh, and, and the supercapacitor also have a, a seven seconds charge time. Here we define a term which is called the total power or PT, as you can see, which is equal to the sum of all output power of the modules. And uh, it must be always equal to zero in order to, uh, in order to make the balance between generation and load. We use this term in order to evaluate the performance of the, po the power balancing performance of the system. Here you can see the performance of the system during a normal operation. As you can see, the net power has a high frequency variation. These are the blue lines, but the, the power that is sent to the battery has a smooth variation. So uh, the power smoothing performance is very good. As you can see, you can see the green line, which is the total power, and it is always equal to zero during the simulation, simulation interval. So the power balancing performance of the system is also great. Now here we examine and evaluate the performance of the system during a sudden variation on the load. As you can see, when there is no cooperation between the PV and the supercapacitor after a sudden loss of a major load, the supercapacitor is immediately the, the supercapacitor immediately becomes full charge and it cannot participate anymore in power balancing and smoothing perform uh, in per power balancing and the smoothing. So we will have an unbalanced power generation and load for around 30 seconds. But using our technique that provide that has a and in this technique we have a cooperation between the PV and the supercapacitor. You can see that when the PV feels that the supercapacitor supercapacitor is going to be full charge, it's reduced its output power um, and for exactly for the amount of power that the supercapacitor is supposed to uh, absorb. So the system can maintain its uh, balance during a sudden loss of a major load. So you can see that using this technique, we increase the reliability of the system during a sudden uh, change of the, during a sudden load change. Here also you can see the performance of the cooperation, uh, the advantage of the cooperation between battery and the supercapacitor. In this experiment, we use a supercapacitor that has a 100 watt hour energy capacity. Uh, you can see that with this capacity, the supercapacitor, if there is no cooperation, the supercapacitor becomes full charge because uh, there are some low frequency power sent to the supercapacitor as a result of non-ideal filters. Uh, but when we provide the cooperation between the battery and the supercapacitor, the battery prevents the supercapacitor to immediately charge and discharge. So the system can operate uh, in a normal operation and the PV don't need to reduce its power generation to maintain the balance. So we have more power generation. In addition, uh, as you can see in the second experiment, we test the performance, we test the advantage of the, this cooperation during a sudden loss of a major load. As you can see, when we have no cooperation, it takes around 11 minutes uh, for it's six minutes for the supercapacitor to come back to the normal operation. So it takes six minutes for the PV to come back to the maximum power point tracking. But using this cooperation, the battery immediately discharged the supercapacitor because of its because it has a control on, on the OC of the supercapacitor. So the PV can come back to the maximum power point tracking after 30 seconds. So as you can see, we increase the efficiency of the system and increase by reducing the required size of the supercapacitor. Now to summarize the results of this research, I can tell you that we design a complex logic for the system. 
The logic of the agents is not very complex, but the, lo the logic of the overall system is very complex and it is not easy to design this logic using a centralized controller or it can be a very tedious task. In addition, so as a result of this, we provide lots of cooperation between the modules inside the system. As you see, the cooperation between the supercapacitor and the PV increase the uh, reliability of the system and the cooperation between battery and the supercapacitor increases the efficiency of the system. So we uh, reduce the complexity of the system design, we increase the uh, reliability as well as increasing the efficiency of the system. Thank you very much for your attention. Please ask me if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, that um, great, great presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions actually. Um, so we've got two for you. Did you consider the uh, line? Let me to stop sharing. Okay. Oh, sorry, okay. you ready? Yes. Okay. Um, did you consider the line impotence of solar PV, BES, and supercapacitor? Um, no, no, I didn't consider this impedance, but in our in our recent research, we are we are trying to uh, make the model more complicated. Uh, for the supercapacitor, we, we we consider the supercapacitor is ideal and it, it doesn't have any power losses inside it. In order to simplify the mathematical model of the system, because uh, the model that we use is very very complex, so to reduce the complexity, we didn't consider the loss of power inside the capacitor. Super capacitor. Awesome. Um, we've got another one. Said, Would there be any performance impact on the system if the data communication rate is different? Excuse me, uh, I couldn't understand. Could you please repeat your question? Yeah. Would there be any performance impact on the system if the data communication rate is different? Uh, yes, but. Uh, you mean if the data come if the communication what uh, if you have problem in the communication you mean? I think so. I'm actually going to really quick unmute the person who asked this question, and they can ask it themselves. Uh, uh, would you be any effect on the control performance of the supercapacitor space converter if the double frequency components uh, if the double Uh, would there be any effect on the control performance of the supercapacitor based on the converter if the double frequency components? Um, I've not checked it, yes, but I think it doesn't have any, uh, per I think it doesn't have any effect on the control performance of the system because um, it, the mathematical equation that, that we used uh, uh, and the dynamic equation of the supercapacitor doesn't have any uh, any, any direct impact of this on, on the operation of the supercapacitor. Uh, okay. You know, uh, huh, there, is, there is a question that data communication rate is different between agents. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have different, uh, in the agents, uh, the communication between agents, the signals that the agents sends to each other is related to the voltage, to the power of their, if each other. So, uh, the the communication rate of the agents is not very high, but uh, all the agents uh, I we use the same we use the same communication for the uh, top level controllers. Uh, the low level controllers of the agents just co co communicate with their associated higher level controllers and not cooperate with the uh, for example agents and agents low level controllers. Just the high level controllers receive the data of the other agents, uh, so they. In the, with this point of view, they have the same rate of communication rate, but inside the system, we have different rate of communication because it's related to the level of the controllers. Fantastic, Ali. Uh, you've, it looks like you've got a lot of really great things going on and we really appreciate you uh, presenting today, but also contributing to the research work of the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and next, I'd like to welcome our final speaker, Anju James, who is a student at, at New Mexico State University uh, and uh, working under the direction of Dr. Jay Misra. And Anju, I'll let you take the screen and, and your... Uh... Thank you.
Hi all. <clears throat> I am Anju from Computer Science Department of NMSU. Um, and I'm working in communication side of the smart grid. Today, I'm going to talk about the quality of service aware NDN based network architecture for smart grid. And uh, this discussion includes what is NDN, why NDN is required in smart grid, our proposed architecture, and some simulation results. NDN is an information-centric networking and it supports reliable communication architecture for smart grid in terms of scalability, protocol interoperability, security, and quality of service. And we enable QoS in communication network by classifying the traffic based on priority, implementing multiple transmission queues, and uh, using token bucket for traffic control. So initially, we will look at what is NDN. NDN is a uh, communication architecture. Um, and NDN stands for Named Data Networking. Currently, we are using IP as our communication architecture, in which we use source and destination address for the communication. Named Data Networking is an alternative for currently used IP architecture and uh, proposed future internet architecture. The basic fundamental block of this named data networking architecture is the node. And we can configure each node into consumer, router, and producer. As you can see in this figure, this is the very simple communication topology of NDN architecture. Consumer or subscriber is the person who is requesting for the data. And producer is the person who is providing the data. The data request is known as interest and uh, the producer will respond back with the, the data requested. The intermediate router is responsible for the data or interest packet forwarding. As the name resembles, NDN manages the communication between entities using the name of the packet. In IP, we know it is based on IP address. Here, we use the name of the packet. And there will be a NAC packet, which is negative acknowledgement sent to the consumer in case the router could not forward the interest to the producer. And the, uh, we can use the namespace according to application requirement, and it will be hierarchical in structure. We will discuss about it in coming slides. For the simulation purpose, NDN offers its own simulator, which is known as NDN SIM, and it is based on NS3 network simulator. First, we will see what is a node. A node of NDN system includes several modules. First is content store, which is a cache, which supports the supports the um, data reusability at uh, end um, at edge routing. Next is pending interest table. As the name resembles, it is the table which stores the information of the interest. Next is forwarding strategy, which is similar to the routing protocol in currently used IP architecture. It offers, uh, by default, it offers multicast best route and some other uh, strategies. And we can create our own custom strategy. And there is a FIB, which is a forwarding information base, which is equivalent to the routing table in IP protocol. And it stores the destination address and path to it. Next, we will see the NDN architecture. So first, we will see how an interest packet is forwarded from a consumer to the producer. The interest will be generated from the consumer and uh, uh, the interest packet will be forwarded to content store. This is a single node in the communication architecture. Once the interest packet is received in this content store, it will check whether there is an entry as same as the interest. That means that particular data is requested by someone else before and it's already cached in the content store. If it matches, the data will be returned and communication overhead is reduced there. If there is no matching entry for this particular interest, that interest packet will be forwarded to pending interest table. 
we will have an interest table with the interest name, incoming interface, and outgoing interface. Sending time. So uh, we if we will check whether there is a matching entry in the pit table. If there is a matching entry, that means someone else already requested for the same interest and waiting for the data. So we don't have to request it again. We simply add the incoming interface information in this table and we will wait for data to come back. If there is no matching entry, then based on the FIP table information, which is the routing information and the forwarding strategy, which is the routing protocol, based on these two elements, we will be forwarding it to the producer. Next is how data is forwarded from producer to the consumer. Once we receive uh, the data in a node, we will be checking the matching entry in the PIC table because here we don't have any IP address. So we have to send it back to the same interface which requested for that particular data. Those information will be stored in this table and if there is a matching entry, the data will be multicasted to, the, to all the interfaces which requested for this particular data. And after that, the data will be cached in the content store and pit entry will be removed. Sometimes when this data is available, there will not be any matching entry in this pit table because it is the, uh, the timeout happened. RTT is the round trip time and if there is a timeout, in that case also, this particular entry for interest will be removed from this table. This is how the Indian architecture works. We will see an example. So here is one user and he need an in, he need a video from CNN. So he will generate an interest with name CNN slash video. And it is connected to router D and the FIP table, which is forwarding information base. In this table, it will have entry for that particular producer and the path to it. This will be in ascending order of priority. So first we will choose for A. So if the interest is forwarded to A interface, that means it can reach to the data. If A interface is not working, it will look for B. And if A and B are not working, it will go through this path. So this is the hierarchical structure of the name. Next, we will see uh, what is the importance of NDN in smart grid. Smart grid means power system with communication. So here, uh, we have presented one diagram which uses IEEE 39 bus system and communication network is imposed on top of it. So you can see multiple entities here, PMUs, PDCs, and uh, wide area controllers. These entities have to communicate each other and for that purpose, we are using this communication topology. And this blue links and this blue uh, box represents the communication network. This blue are the routers. And here you can see in, in an interest name. This is an example name. We can use whatever name we want based on the application requirements. And here we use IEEE 39. And here is one for priority class. Based on this information, it can be high, low, or medium. Based on that information, we are classifying the packet into three different priorities, PDC, measurement, PMA. This is just an example. We can have whatever we want. So the currently existing IP uses IP address and it has its own drawbacks. It does not do well in device heterogeneity, protocol and standards interoperability, application QoS requirements and security. In this particular research, we are focusing on the quality of service requirements of the application. In our proposed architecture, we are introducing a new strategy, which is QoS strategy and it is derived from the existing default multicast strategy. In this model, we are classifying the packet into three different priorities, low, high, and medium. The protection messages which request low latency and high reliability is termed as type one traffic. Control messages which requires high reliability is termed as type two traffic. And others are termed as best effort traffic or type three traffic. And we will have multiple queues and each queue is based processed based on weighted fair queuing and there is a token bucket. 
in each node of the network we will have this system so this is the more detailed view of the multiple queue implementation and token bucket we will receive a packet with the, the priority information in it and based on that priority value from its name we will classify it into high medium and low and these queues will be processed using weighted fair queue algorithm and to control the traffic flow we are using token bucket each queue will have its own token bucket and token generation rate will be different for each queue even though this next is the packet from high priority queue and there is no token available for that particular queue means this packet will not be dequeued so that is how we are controlling the communication data flow this is some of the uh, simulation results we have included we did this experiment in ieee 39 bus system and uh, we are comparing baseline ndn icasm and icap so icasm is the uh, is our previous work which focus on the multiple available paths and uh, icap is our current proposed system which uses multiple queues and token bucket baseline ndn is the original ndn framework which does not support quality of service in our simulation we used um, we configured the network into 27 routers 10 wide area controllers 12 pmus and 2 pdcs and we can generate this we can configure uh, the source nodes and um, producers as per our requirement and uh, we can set packet generation rate uh, differently for different types of packets like uh, as you can see here type 1 type 2 and type 3 had packet generation rate is 90 150 and 300 packets per second also we can configure token generation rate also differently token bucket capacity we maintain 1000 tokens for all the traffic flows if we see the graph um, our proposed architecture uh, over performed uh, all the other methods like uh, baseline indian and icasm in the case of loss rate type type 1 and type 2 was outperformed but in the case of type 3 baseline ndn is doing better the reason for this is for type 1 and type 2 traffic baseline ndn uses unicast and we uses multicast that means network congestion will be more icasm and icap both uses multicast and uh, we will be we are doing better than icasm and uh, we enable the quality of service also this is the comparison between uh, ip and uh, ndn so this is this is this we did as part of the icasm work which does not support the quality of service if we see the packet loss comparison we set up the network to test for zero uh, percentage network congestion 20 percentage network congestion and 50 percentage network congestion we can see that for ndn we don't have any uh, packet loss and next is the comparison for latency this is zero percentage network congestion this is 20 percentage and this is 50 percentage network congestion regarding the latency we can see that udp is doing better then next is tcp and last comes the ndn this is because udp has the less um, header size and uh, that is 8 bytes and uh, for tcp it is 20 bytes and for ndn it is 40 bytes but as the network congestion increases we can see that packet delivery is getting affected for tcp and udp but there is no much packet delivery changes for uh, ndn so if we see this uh, within 30 millisecond um, ndn is completing 100 percentage of the packet delivery udp and tcp is 75 and 80 percentage respectively 
So this is our qualities of service aware networking architecture overview. Um, we are classifying the network based on the priority with to high, medium and low. And uh, we did a lot of other experiments to check the scalability. Like uh, this is IEEE 39 bus system. We also did Monte Carlo simulations in 123 bus system, 650 bus system. And uh, uh, we could identify a relationship between the packet generation rate and token generation rate. Also in future, we are planning to use the machine learning models uh, so that we can dynamically assess the network behaviors and uh, adjust the token generation rate for that. So that is our future plan. And yeah, that's about our research. Thank you. That is fascinating. Um, that's absolutely fascinating because it just shows how far we've come as far as our networking arch architecture goes. Um, I had a question come in that uh, is a little uh, general, but I'm hoping you'll be able to answer it. Um, how long do you think it will take for NBN architecture to uh, replace IP TCP architecture? Um, do you see that happening in the next few years? Do you think it will happen? Um, NBN is kind of uh, developing stage, so we cannot... Um... We may have to perform the real-time simulations, and this is just simulation. We need to test it in real-time scenarios to uh, evaluate the system. Maybe in near 10 years, it will get implemented. Outstanding. Um, we are just almost at time. Again, thank you for your question, and I will turn it back to Selena. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> and thank you so much, Anju. We really appreciate your uh, presentation today. And it's exciting to see that you're finding results in the simulation uh, platform and also looking forward to seeing things, um, where things go next with machine learning and uh, maybe using some of the test beds that the Smart Grid Center supports at uh, SWTDI at New Mexico State and Mesa del Sol up here at uh, UNM, as well as the, the microgrid and nanogrid at the Santa Fe Community College. So um, one of the things that is, is sad about being in the virtual environment is that it's very hard to, to get, show appreciation to our presenters, but please join me in a virtual round of applause to thank our, our presenters today. And... Um, it's, it's fantastic to see such uh, great research from our, our young researchers. I'm going to share my screen real quick here. And um, just do a quick reminder that tomorrow will be the award ceremony related to this uh, New Mexico Research Symposium. And so you're welcome to join us at three. All of our events are hosted up out of our website and we will post this recording um, there as well. You can expect to see it sometime before the end of next week. So if you have anybody that you'd like to share this with, it will be available at the EPSCOR website then. So with that, I think I'd like to uh, call an end to our, our Smart Grid seminar. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. And we hope you have a, a good afternoon. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>